Good evening, everybody. I'm Kerry Prendergast, and I'll MC tonight's celebration of Dennis's life. Now, I don't intend to say much, as there are more knowledgeable speakers, and we have a lot to get through. You all have a program which gives the order of events, so I won't be hopping up and introducing uh, the people uh, doing the tributes. Dennis and Verna, you cannot separate the two in terms of their philanthropy. They've done amazing things, not just for Wellington, but for New Zealand. This concert room in which we sit tonight was built due to their generosity, as was the Adam Art Gallery. Dennis will be missed by arts and music lovers alike. His wonderful smile always enlightened any function. His face staring over his Rolls Royce's steering wheel is an enduring memory. <laughs> I must now give you the health and safety message. In the event of an earthquake, please drop to the ground, get under cover where possible, they're pretty small chairs, and hold until the shaking stops. The fire alarm sounds continuously, please evacuate the building using the nearest exit and continue, and continue up the drive to gate 8 Kelvin Parade. Um, at the end of this evening's performances and tributes, Verna would love you all to join her for a glass or two of wine and something to eat that will be held downstairs. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Carol Hartley. Carol. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. Dennis was justifiably proud of his life. He was proud of his family, especially of Verna. He appreciated creative, intelligent people. He loved to entertain and wasn't the first to be the centre of attention himself. He enjoyed shopping and was brought Verna's clothes, she tells me, if she let him. And he loved to laugh. I first met Dennis nearly 30 years ago. He'd employed a public relations company headed by Simon Walcott. Dennis had thought Simon himself would represent him. It didn't quite work out that way. Simon was a great supporter of the arts, but in those days was rather swamped by political intrigue. Dennis looked elsewhere. It could be a little daunting. I was relatively new to PR and luckily passed Dennis's recruitment test. In Wellington, his style stood out, well-groomed and always immaculate in a tailored three-piece suit. In 30 years, I never saw him in what I would call casual clothes. He was very charming, <coughs> spoke beautifully, and drove, as Kerry said, a large Rolls Royce. As well as sometimes riding in the Rolls Royce, my Adam Foundation projects had many perks. Working with Dennis, I met talented people of all ages. Dennis and Ben had a circle of wonderful friends. And Dennis himself was quite a treat. He had the truly amazing memory of a great raconteur. Dennis had a big life. Born in Berlin in 1924, of German-Jewish family, he was the fourth and youngest child. His older brothers, Peter and Ken, and sister Loni, have all passed away now. Has Dennis joined them? Difficult to say, because he owned to being an agnostic, and two of his siblings turned to Catholicism. It's not only life that can be complicated. <laughs> His parents were well-off business people who ran a cultured household. His father was a pianist and his mother an artist. They experienced the rise and the horrors of Hitler. The Hitler youth persecuted Dennis at school. With Jewish businesses being attacked and passports stamped with a large J, life in Berlin became unviable. Brothers Peter and Ken were already away. A university in France for Peter 
and a boarding school in Scotland for Ken. Dennis was to join Ken in Scotland. With family in Britain, the Adams could escape Germany, but only with huge sacrifice, leaving all their valuables behind, except gold coins smuggled out by Dennis's mother, risking a Nazi death sentence. Her bravery provided the family a living, a boarding house, very enterprising and fortunate, as Dennis's father died only a few years later. You will start to see how Dennis's character and where it came from, an adventurous spirit, independence, determination, and courage. He needed it when war broke out, and he was 16, living in London. Police arrested him as an alien, and he was sent to an internment camp in the Isle of Man. This seemed to him rather unfair, given his oldest brother, Peter, was an intelligence officer at the London War Office, and Ken was in the RAF. Yes, the arrest was a mistake, but still very frightening for a teenage boy. By now, Dennis spoke fluent English with a Scottish accent. <laughs> Acquired at school, he gained an accountancy qualification and work in an insurance office. But he was desperate to follow Brother Ken into the RAF. At 18 years old, Dennis got his wish and began flight training, including time in England and Rhodesia. Active service began in 1942. And by the end of the war, he had flown harbors, hurricanes, tiger moths, typhoons, and spitfires. He also became an accomplished, an accomplished flying instructor. Two New Zealand commanders of 183 Squadron were Dennis's introduction to Kiwis. They were forthright, no nonsense personalities. And it was this experience, and having relatives here, that brought him to explore New Zealand. That he stayed here and became a memorable Wellingtonian had quite a lot to do with meeting Bernard Finlayson at the celebrated Majestic Cabaret. <laughs> at the age of 29, Dennis was permanently smitten. No speech of Dennis's ever omitted the phrase, Bernard's really the brains. <laughs> Their 50th wedding anniversary was celebrated in this very room with a Gareth Farr composition commissioned by Dennis for Verna. In his last few years, I sympathise with Dennis's sentimental outbursts. With declining health, his actions revealed his thoughts when he reached for Verna's hand. But going back to Dennis's early and astonishingly varied career, it's hard to imagine Dennis pumping gas in a service station, a bomb that he brought in Britannia. He once told the story of his furious reaction to a young pup in a sports car who shouted, chop, chop, to demand speedy service. Can any of you imagine saying chop, chop to Dennis? <laughs> his instincts were right. He soon had offices of oh, this something. The Patoni business did give them a home and an income. And while he was setting up the innovative insurance business, Adam and Adam. His instincts were right. He soon had offices in Auckland, Christchurch, and Australia. Those business instincts never left him. After selling Adam and Adam, he formed Primary and Excess, a niche insurance company. And within five years, he increased stakeholders' investment by 50%. Wouldn't that be nice? At close to 70, he was also managing his independent consultancy and the Adam Foundation. Hard work was Dennis's modus operandi, and it was how he made even this space possible. We have all benefited from Dennis's work ethic. Some foundation projects could be quite physical. And Dennis was very hands-on. If he could do something himself, he would. Not averse to taking his jacket off and rolling up his sleeves. 
in the olden days, the portrait gallery was in the defunct parliamentary debating chamber on Lambton Quay. The space was shared with the Photographic Society on the mezzanine. Judy Williams, the artist, and husband, Commander Bill Williams, managed the gallery. Judy was keen to raise the gallery's profile and funding to enable a move to its own space. The Adam Portrait Gallery was born as part of this strategy. The first year, I did the promotion, and Dennis received and unwrapped all the entries, corresponding with artists and potential judges. Exhausting for Dennis, but quite exciting. There's a wonderful photo of Dennis carrying a large portrait of another man of modest stature, who had also made considerable contributions to our city. Sir Peter Jackson is clasped firmly in Dennis's arms. The Foundation's awards originally swapped between the visual arts, music, and literature. One year, Dennis decided he would give the award to a young, talented scriptwriter. The award to take place at the opening of the Oscar-winning Brother Ken's design exhibition. Dennis had secured the Wellington City Gallery as curators, but was quite close to, but it was quite close to the exhibition's shipping date from Europe when the gallery's director was said the space was no longer available. I won't repeat Dennis's reaction. At the time, Philip Markham was on the board of the New Zealand Academy of Fine Arts, and he came to the rescue with the Academy space at the Old Dominion Museum, currently home to the Great War Exhibition. Sorry, Sir Peter. Sir Ken beat me to it. He was almost certainly the first Oscar winner to have an exhibition there. Adam Awards multiplied. The annual Adam Writing Award, hatched by Bill Manhai and Dennis, is heading for its 20th year. I remember in the early days, this award was also the not-to-be-missed Christmas drinks party. It was probably also where I gave up trying to wrestle Dennis's glass of wine from him before he made his speech. <laughs> Dennis was an astute businessman, a generous philanthropist, a great Wellingtonian and a very loyal friend. Over the years, it was obvious how much he delighted in giving and hosting at an event functions. Helping the young to blossom was a great joy to Dennis and to Ella. I have, re I have a recent, I think it's amusing, memory of visiting Dennis and Ella, where Dennis's health was failing we didn't have a lot to smile about. I must have imbibed a bit too much and sat on a small antique coffee table, thinking it was a stool. The table and my dignity crashed to the floor. <laughs> then I started chuckling and then outright laughing, still enjoying his long life with Verna and still dressed stylishly in a new, casual, sport jacket, which Verna had bought for Dennis. We'll miss you, Dennis. I'd actually like to now announce that Imbal is going to um, play Akadish, which is a Jew Jewish morning song.
weeks ago I received an email one Friday, I think it was, to tell me that he had passed away. And I felt very sad initially, but after a couple of moments' reflection, the sadness gave way to real pleasure that I had known such a good man uh, and that we should all rejoice that Dennis Adam lived in our midst for many years and made such a profound contribution to this city uh, and to the arts world generally. I first was introduced to Dennis many years ago at a Sunday afternoon concert in the old Islet Theatre and someone said to me that I was on the board of Creative New Zealand. Dennis, always honest and to the point, said, don't you mean destructive New Zealand? <laughs> I think there been some problem over funding the opera or whatever, Jane, uh, but uh, that was the comment that was made, but I resisted biting back and we became very good friends. Uh, and it was a great pleasure to, to get to know Dennis and Werner. Some people may here think that Werner and I are related because we share the name Finlayson. Uh, we worked out they're probably not related, but you never know, relations can pop up in the funniest of places. My mother was always telling me uh, to be polite to Annie King because she was a second cousin. <laughs> uh, the work of the foundation uh, is something that is very special indeed. When I first went on the foundation, David Carson Parker had come on, the chief executive of the Wellington City Council, ex officio, uh, is always a member of the foundation. But the strength of the foundation was in the commitment to the arts by Dennis and Werner. And if you want evidence of what the foundation does, one only has to look around you. The commitment here to Victoria University, which continues as we have that wonderful development down in the old town hall. We have the commitment to youth through the National Youth Orchestra. And above all, Colin Marshall loves it when I say these things. We have the commitment to that magnificent chamber music festival, the biennial festi festival held in Nelson this time at the beginning of 2019. Such a fantastic festival that started off small uh, and is of now real international quality. But it's not just institutions or orchestras or festivals that Dennis and Werner have supported over the years. It's individuals. And at the first meeting I can recall the young musician who wanted a little bit of help to get to the Juilliard School or whatever. There was always the commitment to the individual. The foundation will go on because of the commitment of Dennis and Werner to ensure that it's an intergenerational foundation. I had to go off it when I became Minister for the Arts, but the first thing I did when I was flung out into the wilderness, this is, this is true, was ring Werner and say, you want me back on again? <laughs> Uh, and so uh, it's a great pleasure to be back on the foundation with Alistair Macbeth, with the Chief Executive of Wellington City, uh, and to work with Werner. The foundation has made and will continue to make a fabulous contribution to the arts in New Zealand. And what I like about it, it's, as with the James Wallace Foundation, it's an example to people the arts really do flourish when individuals get involved. So thank you to Verna for her wonderful uh, support of Dennis over the years. Uh, we will miss him. We will miss that infectious laugh. I still look up uh, in Bay 26 to, sit, uh, to, to where Dennis and Verna used to sit uh, for the NZSO. Uh, and we will miss him. But at the end of the day, we rejoice that he has lived. We rejoice that we were his friends. And I can tell you this, we'll never forget. I'm going to tell the story of this room. The Victoria University School of Music spent its first 40 years on the top floor of the unloved and now demolished chemistry wing of the Hunter Building. Not long after I joined the staff, the scientists moved out. 
We were left alone in a building that was popularly believed to have unsafe levels, levels of radiation and was certainly an earthquake risk. We had to keep shifting the pianos around to avoid new leaks in the ceiling. David Fark would write for our last uh, lunchtime concert each year a, a, a variation on a popular song as a form of gentle activism. So the first dedicated to Danny, Danny Taylor, the Vice Chancellor. Oh, Danny boy, the bricks, the bricks are falling. <laughs> the next was a beautiful arrangement of that combined the First World War Goodbye song with um, Now is the Hour, and that's enshrined in the finale to David's suite called Moonshine. Music-loving Ian, Ian Axford became Vice Chancellor in 1982, and things started to move. This site was earmarked for a new school of music building, and Bill Ellington engaged as architect. The last thing Education Minister Merv Wellington did before leaving office to campaign in Rob Muldoon's snap election was to sign off on the plans. But there was a catch. Those plans had to conform to University Grants Committee guidelines that allowed only for teaching spaces. The argument that for a music school, performance areas were teaching spaces fell on deaf ears. We faced the frustration of a splendid new facility without a decent rehearsal studio or concert room. The only solution, it seemed, was to find a way of augmenting UGC funding for ourselves. I remember the staff meeting, all of us, Margaret Nielsen, who's here, I think, and Elizabeth Kerr, and my other colleagues, sitting with rather glum looks when Ross Harris suddenly mentioned that he and his wife, Barbara, had become friends with Dennis and Werner, and that perhaps we could ask Dennis if he would help. Ross made a phone call, and the following Sunday morning, it was pouring with rain, incidentally, Ross and I brought Dennis here to look at the site. Within minutes, he agreed to invest in the new concert room. That was Dennis, of course, decisive, enthusiastic, and above all, deeply appreciative of how music and the arts can enrich our society. The architect's concept was simple. The building simply got stretched to accommodate this room. There were contingent benefits. The electroacoustic studios beneath our feet here were enlarged, and on the level below that, we gained additional practice rooms and a keyboard laboratory. But above all, we had our beautiful Adam concert room, the ACR. Construction began in 1987, and we moved in in 1989. By that time, we had another music-loving vice chancellor who's sitting just over there, Dan Les Holbrook. We celebrated moving into this building with a festival whose concerts I still remember absolutely vividly. From the minute the building was occupied, the ACR was utilised around the clock for rehearsals, workshops and performances. For several years, actually, the music students even organised an annual ball in here. Not just the University Orchestra, but the Wellington Youth Orchestra, and for a time, the NZSO National Youth Orchestra made this their rehearsal home. It was and is a beautiful venue for chamber music. During vacations and in the dead of night, it frequently became a recording studio. The School of Music flourished, and that was in no small measure uh, because we had an acoustically fine facility that functioned well and that felt inviting. That was Dennis's first significant involvement with the university. As he and Werner moved on to other projects, such as the Adam Art Gallery, we never lost that sense of satisfaction and pride at having been the ones who brought him on campus here one wet Sunday morning. If I may end just on a personal note, it was a huge pleasure for me to stay in touch with Dennis through my years at the NZSO and more recently at Chamber of Music New Zealand. Engagement with Dennis was always direct, open, and fun. He and Werner, whose judgment and taste he so admired, have been wonderful supporters of the arts, as you know. The word bullion was invented to describe Dennis. Whenever I had the chance to speak at post-concert function with him, he would very considerately send me his notes in advance so that my speech could dovetail with his. <laughs> then, when it came to, came to it, he would walk up to the mic speech notes in hand, 
hand and then head off in a completely different direction. <laughs> Inspired by the concert that he just enjoyed, spontaneity and enthusiasm trumped careful preparation every time. I wonder actually what notes he'd have sent for me today. Um, whatever, I would still be saying thank you, Dennis, for all that you did, and thank you, Verna, too.
Dena Kodi Katoa. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this very special occasion. I'm Tina Barton. I've been director of the Adam Art Gallery for 11 years. And before that, I taught in art history here at Victoria. In the late 1990s, I had the pleasure and privilege of helping Jenny Harper develop the proposal that sowed the seed for the gallery. And I was a member of the project team that made our plans reality. I'd like to acknowledge Dennis and Werner Adam for helping us realize our dream. Without you, the beautiful building that proudly graces the Kelvin campus would simply not exist. I'm so pleased that you will live on in our name and in all that we stand for. It's sad to be standing here knowing that Dennis is no longer with us, and to also acknowledge that the gallery's architect, the inimitable Sir Ian Atfield, has also passed away. And just this last weekend, I, I attended the funeral of the great New Zealand photographer, Peter Perrier, whose photograph, titled After Rembrandt, was included in the Adam Art Gallery's opening exhibition. This work is now in the university's art collection. Now, as an art historian, I can't go without my visual aids. <laughs> so there's the photograph there. As one gets older, the litany of people passing grows longer. I know the pain this causes friends and family and grapple with the sorry and inescapable truth. This is our all too human destiny. But as someone who cares deeply about the creative dimensions of life, I take comfort in knowing that there are special people who leave us something larger than themselves that we share as our cultural legacy. A beautiful building, an exquisite piece of music, a powerful work of art, a well-written story, a poem, a dance. These things live on, perhaps more than almost anything else we humans choose to make or do. Peter Perrier knew this when he took a photograph of a shell he found in a flea market in Germany that was identical to the one famously etched in 1650 by the great Dutch master. Perrier carried forward into our time a visual memory of Rembrandt's enchantment with the extraordinary beauty of a treasured object that had probably been brought back by traders from the Dutch East Indies. Rembrandt's etching and Perrier's photograph convey each artist's response to nature's diverse creativity. They are each a wonderful gift to share as we go forward into uncertain times. Both have value that outlasts their makers. I think Dennis Adams shared the sense of the life-affirming power of the human imagination and its creative products. Indeed, he once said, I think you need beautiful things around you to make life worth living. He has helped so many artists, musicians and writers, especially at early stages in their careers, and left a precious legacy in buildings like the Adam Art Gallery. I say this is cause for celebration and for reflection. May we learn from Dennis and Werner and share his and their loves and the values that underpin them. Thank you.
Commentators have variously remarked that his was an extraordinary life and that he was the godfather of the arts. I think Dennis would have liked that description. <laughs> Dennis and Werner both worked hard and built a legacy, a legacy that is the Adam Foundation. Dennis went about his philanthropic activities in a thoroughly professional manner, which was, of course, the hallmark of his success in, bus in the business world, and which in turn enabled him to indulge his passion for the arts. Werner was always by his side in the decision making, and I recall on a number of occasions Dennis noting that he would, of course, have to consult with Werner. My personal involvement in the arts has been largely focused around music. The reach of the Adam Foundation into the musical life of this region has been enormous. My comments will therefore focus particularly on what Dennis has contributed to music in our society. As chair of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, I would like to pay particular tribute to the Adam Foundation's sponsorship of the NZSO National Music <coughs> Orchestra, a sponsorship which has endured for 20 years. The sponsorship included the provision of scholarships for individual NYO players which are, which are awarded for performance excellence and achievement. The Adam Foundation stepped in at a difficult time and have remained with us for the long haul. A fantastic commitment which underlies Dennis's objectives, as others have noted, to assist talented young people to develop their potential. The National Youth Orchestra has become a vital component in the development of young musicians in New Zealand, with more than 50% of the members of the NZSO having been members of the National Youth Orchestra. It is a great privilege that the NZSO has been given the opportunity to participate in this concert this evening. Chamber Music has also been the beneficiary of support from the Adam Foundation the Biennial Adam Chamber Music Festival held in Nelson, with artistic direction being provided by members of the New Zealand String Quartet, as Christopher Finlayson noted, has developed over the past 25 years into a festival of truly international standing. The 29 festival will feature the Jerusalem String Quartet, one of the world's preeminent chamber music ensembles, as well as other leading musicians in New Zealand and overseas. Nelson has also hosted the annual Adam Summer School for Chamber Music, again as with the Youth Orchestra, an opportunity for the development of aspiring young musicians. And a further commitment to Chamber Music, the Adam Foundation has recently purchased a magnificent Niccolò Amati viola for use by Gillian Ansel, the viola player in the New Zealand String Quartet. As Edmond mentioned, Dennis had some involvement with the cello, uh, and in particular, that brings me to the Adam Cello Festival and competition held in Christchurch during the period 1995 to 2009. This competition provided yet another opportunity for gifted young players to meet and compete with their international peers. One of the early prize winners in the cello competition was a young Frenchman, Gautier Capuçon. I'm sure, Werner, that you will remember his performance of the Dvorak Cello Concerto and his feet would barely touch the floor. Gautier Capuçon is now one of the great cellists of this generation and has returned to New Zealand several times to perform as a soloist with the NZSO, as indeed have several other participant, participants in the cello competition. NZSO, NZSO National Youth Orchestra, Adam Chamber Music Festival, Adam Chamber Music Summer School, Adam International Cello Festival. There has been a synergy amongst all these wonderful endeavours which has supported the development of young musical talent and provided for New Zealand audiences to hear some of the world's leading musicians. While others will comment or have commented today on the commitment by the Adam Foundation to the development of the National Music Centre, incorporating the strengthened and refurbished town hall, the NZSO look forward to moving to the town hall and rehearsing and performing in the Adam Auditorium. Thank you, Werner, for your contribution and passionate support in all the wonderful endeavours which have had the support of the Adam Foundation. 
You and Dennis have been ardent concert goers over the years. We look forward to seeing you at our future concerts. The NZSO looks forward to performing at the opening of the Adam Auditorium. See you there. <laughs>
Tenekoto, Tenekoto, Kia ora koutou katoa. And my name is Grant Hamlet, the um, Vice Chancellor of Victoria University of Wellington, and it's my great pleasure to be joining you here to uh, celebrate the life of Dennis Adam and to recognise and celebrate the immense contribution that he and his wife Bernard made to Victoria University of Wellington. As patron of the arts, uh, philanthropists, evidence of Dennis and Bernard's com commitment and generosity can be found throughout the university. This very room in which we've just uh, this wonderful performance is central to our school of music and demonstrate Dennis's commitment to excellence in music. The Adam Concert Room provides an outstanding space not just for our students but for the wider public to engage in a variety of musical performances. This room was also chosen by Werner for this memorial concert as you've heard because it was a venue where they held their 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Since 1996, the Adams have supported many talented students through the Adam Foundation Prize in creative writing. The prize is awarded each year to the best student in the Masters in Creative Writing course. Now known affectionately as the Adam in literary circles, the prize has contributed greatly to its recipients and strengthened the field of creative writing, which like the other disciplines Dennis believed in and championed at this university, music and the visual arts, now demonstrate national and international prominence. As Tina shared with us, the Adams also made a significant gift to establish the Adam Art Gallery, giving thousands of people the opportunity to engage with world-renowned artworks on our campus. And most recently, they made a leadership gift towards the National Music Centre. Not only does this transform the potential of the project, but will inspire others to support the centre, an exceptional example of leading through philanthropy. The gift was also instrumental in the university and the NTSO being able to secure additional and critical partnership funding. The National Music Centre will be a lasting reflection of Dennis's generosity and interest and ensure that music and the arts can be enjoyed by future generations of creative New Zealanders in outstanding facilities. To restoring Wellington Town Hall and enlivening Civic Square as a creative hub, the centre will realise the many benefits for our students and the local community and affirm Wellington's reputation as a centre of the arts, creativity and innovation internationally. We believe the impact on music and the arts in this country will be profound, a fitting legacy to the truly transformational impact Dennis and Werner have had on our cultural landscape. Dennis leaves behind an enduring legacy for Victoria University of Wellington and a legacy of opportunity and inspiration for people throughout this country. This evening highlights the high esteem in which Dennis was held by so many. I wish to convey how deeply appreciative the university is for the generosity and entire support of both Dennis and Werner for the enormous benefit of our community. On behalf of Werner, all of our speakers this evening and the university and of course Kerry Prendergast for organising this tonight. I'd now like to invite you all to join us for drinks and enjoy the reception celebrating the life and legacy of this remarkable man. Now we need to do it. Thank you.